welcome everybody to this special um, version of the Wellbeing Culture Forum that we founded in March as an online um, debate and discussion platform um, uh, to discuss the recreation of cities um, in the wake of COVID-19, uh, the, yeah, the deeper inner game of our culture that we see is absolutely necessary to to focus on. This is a this is a absolute premiere because we are now merging these two realities, the virtual one and the real one. I mean, most of uh, our guests are not anymore doing the distinction between the virtual and the real reality, but there is still a distinction. Uh, we were now um, for many months, all of us, uh, basically looking at Zoom screens uh, most of the uh, working time. And now we are sitting here in the courtyard of the gallery of Johann Koenig. Um, uh, beautiful weather, sun, uh, wind, um, but most of our visitors, most of our guests are still uh, looking on us uh, and uh, seeing us uh, through the LC display. So uh, this is now a merge of these two realities and I'm uh, extremely thankful that everybody here is participating in this experiment and I'm very thankful uh, especially to our panelists um, that are here and that we will introduce in a second. I will just say some words about our group. Thermal Group is creating, is now the world leader in creating uh, thermal baths, big um, wellness facilities. We started with the art program in 2017. This was uh, at the Royal Institution in London where we launched the Thermal Art Program. Uh, with the idea that we will uh, need to expand architecture uh, with the vision of uh, artists and we will need to expand the artistic visions with much more resources to be able not only to fill rooms but to build and create rooms. This is something that it has always is very often referring to when he is talking about production of reality. It's the understanding that all reality uh, that is surrounding us is actually uh, meanwhile artificial, meanwhile produced through our thoughts, through our brains, and we are actually able to master it. We are able to create it and we are able to recreate it when it doesn't work as we want. It's not something that is God-given. So when we are basically born into cities, this is something that we are not only able to fill with content, we can recreate it completely. And I think this is a big um, challenge because COVID-19 showed us, we learned a lot through this virus, we learned, uh, learned a lot through this uh, pandemic, and we learned that our cities are basically a monoculture of human life. Yeah? But we cannot live without the other life. We cannot live without the other biological organism that created our bodies in 200, over 200,000 years of evolution. We cannot completely uh, build worlds around ourselves and live without animals, without trees, without you know, a sustainable reconnection to nature. And this... Um, this forum that we are starting today uh, is called From Breaking Bauhaus. This is the session um, that we are starting now to Growing Gaia. This will be the next two sessions that will connect us back, hopefully, with the environment. But to understand how we could go, to imagine how we could go forward, we have to look back into 1917, into the time um, when the Spanish flu was going uh, all over the world, causing over 50 million of deaths. And uh, then uh, after the First World War, Bauhaus 1919 was uh, started in Dessau through Walter Gropius and a group of people that believed that culture can recreate society, that it's not business, it's not politics, it's not where we are now looking for solutions, but it's actually the creative sector that can be really in power to create the core of society. And this is why I'm extremely happy that we have so many people that want to talk with us about exactly this topic and um, I want now to introduce Roya Sachs, my co-moderator today. Thank you so much for preparing this session. And I will give the microphone to you now so you can do the introduction of the other panelists with me together. Thank you, Mikolai. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it is my distinct honor to be the least distinct person on this panel, but um, excited to speak to you all. Um, 
I'm going to do a very condensed bio because if I would read all of your accomplishments, we'd probably be here till Sunday. So Mark Spiegler, here at the very end, hi Mark, is Global Director of Art Basel. He leads Art Basel's international organization, Art Fairs in Basel, Miami, Hong Kong, and its extension into further activities and digital initiatives. Um, the French-American joined Art Basel as co-director in 2007 and Global Director in 2012. Hi Mark, thanks for being here. Hi Roya, thanks for having us. Thank you, Roya. And now it's my honor to introduce the, uh, Hans Ulrich Obrist, uh, uh, the person that when we met the very, very first time uh, and he agreed to be member of our advisory board, uh, he said, we don't have to produce thermal baths, we don't have to produce buildings, we have to produce reality and we have to produce cities. And I don't have to mention the accomplishments of Hans Ulrich Obrist, but I want to mention that he uh, not only as the director, the artistic director of the Serpentine Gallery, but uh, but also as our friend and partner in so many projects. We're looking uh, so much forward to create this reality with you together. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Nikolai. And now also Nicholas Graffia, American, German, multidisciplinary artist. Hi, Nicholas. Um, he holds an MFA from the Kunstakademie in Düsseldorf, and his practice is around scenic figurative narratives, um, dealing with painting, printmaking, performance. He deals with themes of trans-temporal developments, racial, political resistance, and systems um, of social broken heritage that we live in and also how we've outgrown them. Um, recently also had shows in New York at Signs and Symbols and Melange in Cologne. And then it's my honor to introduce Virgil Abloh here on the screen behind me. I don't know if he can see me now looking at him. This is our experiment that we have the the uh, TV and the reality combined. Uh, I'm very happy, Virgil, that you uh, joined this forum again after 2018. We created with Hans Ulrich Obrist this extremely successful for us because we learned so much talk uh, at uh, Art Basel Design Miami, back to the body with Torquase Dyson, with Arthur Jaffa and with other great contributors. And this is where we started uh, to think about how city and culture is interconnected. And this is where I learned that you are actually an architect and that uh, your fashion design is also a way of creating a social sculpture of architecture and we are totally fascinated with this perspective and uh, looking very much forward to your thoughts in this talk. Thank you very much for being here. Um, and now also virtually um, is here on my left, uh, Sumaya Valley, architect and co-founder of the all-female-run experimental architecture and research firm Counterspace in South Africa. Um, a lot of their work is about research and interdisciplinary projects, um, about architecture, community engagement, um, installations, and urban research. Um, and really, key influences of their work is about inclusivity, otherness, and the future, which I think is very interesting in our topic today. Um, Counterspace was also selected for the Serpentine Pavilion in 2020, which is now pushed to next year. But um, the firm is also the youngest recipient of the pavilion, so that's very exciting. Um, thank you, Sumaya, for being with us today. Um, and then last but not least, behind me is uh, Kunle Adeyemi, an architect, designer, and development researcher whose work is internationally recognized for his innovation and originality. Um, he's the founder and principal of Mle. I hope I pronounced that right, um, an architecture and design and urbanism practice that he do, started in 2010. Um, and prior to that, he also worked with Rem Coolhouse for nine years. Thank you so much for being with us, Kunle. Sorry if I'm blocking you. Um, okay, so I really kind of want to dive in with this idea of breaking Bauhaus. But before we break something, we just have to explain why we're breaking it. So why Bauhaus and why is this actually relevant 100 years on? Um, obviously founded in 1919, Bauhaus really strived to create a new type of living, reforming all aspects of life from architecture to mass production, from teaching methods, living space, and also lifestyle. Um, it really also emerged out of a very tumultuous time after World War I. And I think that's really a key 
factor in what Bauhaus strives to do. It was this idea of a new living and what does the building of the future actually look like. Um, and as we all know, history does repeat itself. So um, in periods of turmoil, the one thing that we've seen over and over again in history from Dadaists during World War I, from Ab X movement after World War II, is creativity booms and communities come together. Um, and so we really have to use the past to actually understand the future. Um, so in the wake of the kind of current global and cultural upheaval um, that we're currently experiencing, today we're really going to discuss what principles of Bauhaus we are taking into today's day and age, especially life post-COVID-19, during COVID-19. And there's a few rhetorical questions that are at the opening of the new Bauhaus archive book, which I think are just key questions for us to keep in mind before we start this session. How do we want to live? What should our homes look like? How can I achieve more with less? And what can I contribute to a better life? So in starting that, swiftly moving into a quote from Walter Gropius that Nikolai and I discussed at breakfast this morning, the greatest responsibility of the planner and architect, I believe, is the protection and development of our habitat. Hans Ulrich, I'd love to start this with you. Why and how are these principles of Bauhaus relevant in understanding our current reality, or should we say habitat, like Gropius said? Uh, yeah, I think um, to begin with the beginning, um, we need to sort of obviously address the Bauhaus and Alice Rothan, the great design critic. Uh, for those of you who don't follow her on Instagram, um, Alice Rothan has one of the most fascinating Instagram accounts in, in the world. Um, and she, of course, uh, points out in uh, her extraordinary Instagram, you know, uh, a picture of the Bauhaus, which is hugely problematic. Yeah, you know, the, the, first of all, the brutal and tragic politics of its time, the collusion also, you know, accusation of Nazi collusion, which goes, um, you know, with the Bauhaus. And very important also the misogyny of the early years, you know, of, of the Bauhaus. So, you know, I think we should begin with that, right, in terms of uh, uh, critically assessing the problems uh, of the Bauhaus. I think what is important is also to look at the history of the Bauhaus um, in a way that may be forgotten, forgotten aspects are visited, right? Because obviously we always quote, you know, Gropius, we, we, we quote the very few protagonists, but I think it's important that there are actually forgotten protagonists in the Bauhaus who are very important for, and maybe more important for what concerns the world today. So for example, Hannes Meyer, who is the school's second director, um, deserves revisiting because he was very interested in collective architecture. And I think that is something which is super interesting today and is something I'm sure we're going to hear more from you know, the architects on, on the panel who are all interested in that, as we know from previous conversations, you know, the idea actually of how we, we collectively build uh, something Hannes Meyer explored. Interesting also is, of course, Lotte Stambese, uh, who is one of the extraordinary you know, women protagonists of the Bauhaus, who is not remembered as uh, she should. She was extraordinary. She was an urbanist. And uh, coming back to what Nicolas said, you know, she planned actually habitats for living. Uh, she planned whole cities in Ukraine and Holland. So I think, you know, in a way, I wanted to begin with that. I think if we think about what we can learn from the Bauhaus, we should do what uh, Eric Hobsbawm always said, you know, we live in an age of a lot of information, but not necessarily more memory. And there is somewhere amnesia still at the core of this information age. And it is kind of fascinating, you know, that these figures, if you think of, you know, Stan Beze, um, you know, even after an endless celebration of the centenary of the Bauhaus, which led to literally hundreds of exhibitions worldwide, are still not household names. So I think that's, uh, that's important. I think the other aspect in answer to your question um, is, of course, the idea also of, um, uh, in a way, thinking about uh, sustainability. And uh, in terms of, of design, we spoke about this with uh, Enzo Mari the other day, because uh, I'm working on a show uh, with Enzo Mari for the Triennale in Milano, which should have opened actually in, uh, in spring. Uh, and he says that one of the things uh, which is so important if you think about you know, the habitat also of the future is that it's, it goes away from this idea of the disposable, no? that design and architecture are not disposable. And it's obviously, you know, that means that things have to last, that we start to think about long durational thing. And that you know, brings us in a way 
to form a phantasma. The designers who at the moment have the exhibition at the Serpentine, and they looked actually at uh, the, the history in a way uh, uh, of a material and also the present use of a material, which is you know the timber, the timber industry, a gigantic industry, and we could do that also for other materials, you know, in the construction industry, for example. Uh, and they look at the history of timber, you know, in design, and they look how actually the sort of universities and also homogenized use of timber leads to extinction. Thank you so much, Hans Ulrich. All so interesting and fascinating, and I agree there are so many protagonists that aren't enough spoken about, and um, you know, all this idea about sustainability and resources is definitely something we're going to dive into, and this idea of um, you know, eco-architecture and what does the future of our living look like. Um, I think one of the other key principles that I'd like to also just kind of side curve into is um, also this idea of innovation and technology that really also shifted during the Bauhaus. So, um, you know, there was a new ethos that shifted with one of the first exhibitions, Art and Technology, A New Unity in 1923. And suddenly we find ourselves in a time where art and technology have had to come together quicker and more so than ever before, I think, to be able to kind of communicate with the masses in every shape from museums to corporate companies to also art fairs. So I think, Mark, I'd love to hear from you, especially because your VS Market Report came out this week, um, and it was really interesting to see actually how many people went onto the viewing room and how many galleries, I think over 70% more joined this year than they did last year. So how do you see this new unity um, in our day and age actually impacting? Um, that's a very large question. I'll try to keep it short because I think there are many people who are maybe more interesting to me than me to follow. I think it's two things before I start. One is I think it's great to have two Chicagoans, me and Virgil, on the panel, because of course ba Chicago is where Bauhaus went after it left Germany and where it thrived in the States. Um, and secondly, I really kind of question the, the title. I think it's not, for me, it's not about breaking Bauhaus. It's about embracing Bauhaus in a new way, you know, a century later. Um, I had a very hybrid day, and I think hybridity is the, is the theme that I think about when I think about art and technology. So yesterday, I did one of my favorite things, which is to run around town and try to see as many galleries and exhibitions as possible. I started with the Kunstwerke, and then I went to the Gropius Bau, appropriately mm -hmm. enough. Um, and there I ran into um, Augustine, who's the curate, the director of the biennial, and we talked about what it meant to curate a biennial now. And he told me that of the 80 artists in the show, only 22 were able to be present. So to, to install, I mean, anyway, every artist, and excuse me for saying this, Nicholas, every artist has a crisis waiting to happen. So but when you're dealing with, with 60 of them by, by a Zoom, it must be even crazier. Um, and then I went to a, a very wide span of galleries. I started with Sweetwater, which is a very new gallery in an apartment in, in you know, sort of at the far end of Kreuzberg. And then I ended at Capitan Petzl, which is, you know, in a, I don't know if it's actually a Bauhaus building, but it's certainly a, a, Bauhaus, a build, Bauhaus style building. Um, and this is really, one of my favorite things in my job is to run around and see art, art, see shows and talk to gallerists and see all the different spaces and, and architectures that people choose to exhibit art within. Um, and then I went, so that was the physical part of my day, which was incredibly interesting. And then I went into a very digital part of my day, which was I did a four and a half hour Zoom call in which we did the selections for the upcoming um, Art Basel online viewing room uh, 2020, which is at the end of the month. And this is just to give you a sense, like normally the selection process lasts a month and a half or two months. You know, this time the deadline was Wednesday, the selections were, were yesterday, and we'll announce the, we'll announce the you know, the, who's in the fair very shortly. And then the, the, the fair itself, the, the show itself, is, starts on September 23rd. Um, so we can do this kind of very rapid thing, and this is the thing that we only announced a few weeks ago. Um, and actually almost 150 galleries signed up or applied for the only 100 slots. So it's not just that we're announcing it, it's also that the market is embracing it. And I don't want to preview it, but there are great projects that people came up with, and some of them are very specific. Well, they're all specific to the year, because all the works are from 2020, but they're also very specific to the context and, and to what's going on this year. Um, and yet, I would never want to have a day which was only the second part. I would never, I don't want to live in a digital art world. I don't think any of us want to. I think for me, it's been enormous relief and pleasure to be out on the road again, to see the people from the art world, to see artworks in person. You know, and I think um, 
so on the one hand, uh, it's good. This, this period has forced a frankly quite reactionary art world vis-a-vis -vis technology to sort of start moving faster or even to start moving at all in the, in the direction of the digital. Um, and people have learned how to, to make use of digital platforms, have learned how to do great studio tours um, uh, you know, digitally. And on the other hand, I think that's only part of the equation. You know, I think the, the, real, the real part is still the art, is art. I don't think this is a, 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 an industry or a world which can be digitized in the same way. You know? And so um, in an optimistic way, in a very difficult time, what I see is that we should embrace the technology but not too much, you know, that we should understand its limits, you know, in the same way that, you know, people started trying to break up with people by text message when text messaging started, and they realized that actually that, that's a completely caddish thing to do, and that, you know, it's yeah. not appropriate, and I think in the same way, um, I think in the same way, I think to think that it's, to see an artwork online or to see an exhibition online is the same as seeing it physically is absurd, and we shouldn't pretend that that's the case. I think we have to understand the opportunities, but also understand the limits and that we, we can get the most out of this, this future hybrid world. Very well said. I agree, except for about the text message, but. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and I think that, that this idea of also experiencing artwork, it also goes back to this idea of Bauhaus, of a Gesamtkunstwerk, so really experiencing all aspects of all different departments. And I think one of the things that was so um, incredible and innovative about the Bauhaus was this idea of all these different departments from printmaking to ceramics to weaving to glass to metal workshops to theater all coming together under that umbrella. And I think more and more that type of fluidity and creative out of the box thinking is critical in a time where we're having to come up with more original ideas of streaming our creativity. Um, so Nicholas, are there, you know, your work is really a conscious break from tradition. You're combining performance with printmaking and painting. Are there specific principles of the Bauhaus that you take or that you're breaking? And how has your creativity in this process then kind of been adjusted? Um, so, well, I think I'm from a generation that has been exposed to like a lot of different influences. And when I think of my studies, I literally went to like a lot of different classes because I was studying in Germany where you would have like Meister, you know, Meister Schüler classes and stuff like that. And you would study in a particular, like under the um, supervision of a particular professor who has like a certain, you know, focus. However, I think that the Bauhaus has definitely influenced some more than the others. And like you really see that in the way they teach certain works. And I remember from my time when I was still studying Dominique Gonzalez Ferso's class, who was like, a, you know, very transmedial artist and that you really felt that um, this kind of like extension of what it means to create or produce a certain artwork in one medium really kind of like enriched my practice in a way because it always felt like um, whenever you depart from the idea of the painter, let's say the painter or like a sculptor or whatever, you kind of like manage to catch a certain notion in a more precise way, at least that's how it felt to me. And um, I would definitely say that the Bauhaus, not only like in terms of, you know, teaching methods that they applied, I was really into the idea of the Black Mountain College as well. And it was really interesting for me to see how like certain people who, who you know, were associated to the Bauhaus, like Annie Albers, for example, were teaching at the Black Mountain College, because that, that's cool. Those two places were always kind of intertwined for me. And um, the whole idea of the avant-garde there as well was always really, you know, thrilling for me. It was always really intriguing to see. And um, also, like, I think the Bauhaus really often is kind of, like, reduced to this very, very like, design-heavy, like, you know, like, formal ideas. However, there was a huge political dimension in the, in the movement itself as well, I think. Especially when you think of, like, emancipatory acts and, like, um, the, the, the Neue Frau, the New Woman, and uh, those ideas, I think that was what was mo most formative to my practice back then. Yeah. yeah. That's a little bit what is missing right now, right? This, this kind of uh, political approach and a common, uh, common platform. Um, totally. And I, I also love that you brought up Annie Albers because 
also, there are these kind of forgotten Bauhaus women, and there's the Bauhaus Mädels, a book that um, recently came out, and it really also explores how, you know, even though 50% of the stu new students when it started were female, they were forced into specific um, departments they didn't want to be in. Annie Albers wanted to be a painter, but then she was pushed into working in textiles, which worked out for her, but still. So that's something to um, also keep in mind, that there are these dualities, because any artist is not creative in one way, it's creative in every way. Um, I think one of the pioneers um, of that, and this is something I want to gear towards Virgil uh, if, from afar, um, is obviously the theater pioneer Oscar Schlemmer, who really strived and created this new ethos for what does a what is the idea of a new man in this kind of post-industrial era. Um, you know, it's this idea of animalism and restriction, order and chaos, man and machine. Um, he said, I vacillate between two worlds two styles, two attitudes towards life. If I could succeed in analyzing them, I think I could be able to shake off these doubts. Now, Virgil, who is very much a polymath, um, which inspired me when I was reading about Schlemmer, trained as an architect, now a designer, DJ, entrepreneur, engineer. Um, Virgil, how important are these kind of dualities and multifaceted identities in your practice and creativity? When you look at the, um, uh, maybe that didn't come through, but I think it's vital, that sort of freedom. You know, when we talk about the Bauhaus 100 years ago, it's almost as if you're putting humanity in this perfect box and hoping that it reacts to the experiment of the initial premise. And I think what a modern generation does today is, as Hans was saying, we have enough information to go back you know, we have enough curiosity to find the epicenter and then find out what was left out of the history books or the logic. So, you know, this power of being free to float between disciplines, to be human, to contradict, you know, to have a premise and change the idea and readapt is, is what's great about our modern society. You know, we're in the midst of uh, another civil rights movement. You know, we're in the midst of a, a global pandemic that can sort of shed away that construct of this box that humans should naturally fit in. And I think curiosity and, and jumping over boundaries to creating a new reality is, is vital. You know, it's what Mark said about, you know, the art world and the sort of digital, like we can, we can understand that it's a possibility, but we can also reject that to offer up something new. So I think, you know, these are valuable conversations to have from the individual to the mass. You know, how, how are we as a modern society making the boundaries for our art movement or whatever classification we want to put as the title? And for me personally, you know, when I approach my architecture side of my work, when I approach the fashion side of my work, I'm operate or music side, I'm operating on a, a sphere above the tangible and a, that ability to crisscross between disciplines creates a language that sits above sort of um, like a programmatic sense of what the past was built on perhaps. Thank you. I, I love what you just said about this idea of freedom to move because that is exactly what is being kind of taken away from us. So this idea of freedom to move, as you were saying um, creatively, it's also this idea of freedom to move um, physically. So that really, I think, opens up uh, this discussion on the fluidity also of, of architecture. How do we create a space that doesn't define us, but instead creates those fluid spaces? Um, Kunle, also from afar, um, you know, there's this incredible project that I read about that you did in Chicago at the Green Line Art Center, which was a democratic space for creativity and inclusiveness. And the whole main floor was called the free zone because it had no columns and it was completely open. Um, and I love this idea of this concept of, you know, democratic and fluid inclusiveness. Um, how is that something that's a part of your practice and how do you think that's more important today than ever? I think it's in incredibly important, uh, as uh, Virgil also mentioned, freedom, inclusivity. I would also add coexistence and diversity, uh, particularly between humanity and the environment. Uh, that's really what we try to do in our practice. We try to 
uh, promote diversity and coexistence between humanity and the environment. And this, this for, for us is fundamental in allowing uh, people to uh, engage and uh, address some of the challenges that we find in everyday life. And this sort of cuts across the uh, issues that we will probably have experienced even in the last few uh, months, where obviously uh, our, um, our engagement with the environment completely changed during the sort of COVID period. And we, um, you know, we're now starting to understand sort of new realities and really look at, understand the impact of our uh, activities on, on, uh, on the environment. So it's definitely an important starting point. And this, this is where I would also agree with Mark um, that the title for me is also more of a question uh, than actually thinking of breaking it. What, what are the relevant aspects of Bauhaus that still um, become useful in the next hundred years? Um, so, so for me, I think that there are lots of exciting and lots of important uh, bases as a foundation of architecture that also goes into design. Um, issues of materiality, scarcity of resource uh, that we're engaging in, uh, the environment, uh, arts, uh, bringing all these fields together. Um, I think we're at a time where technology indeed um, seem to, seems to offer us a lot of opportunities, but uh, there's also a lot of knowledge that we can uh, gain from history and how we have done uh, so much with uh, uh, so little. So um, thank you very much. Uh, what what, what uh, you mentioned and what was mentioned also by Hans Ulrich and by Roya before, and uh, I, I think what everybody has uh, in its mind is this um, physical distance on the one hand, but this super interconnectivity on the other hand uh, that are somehow you know contradictionary um, tendencies that we are all exposed to. Um, but what seems to be missing and what was very uh, visible and maybe the, the, the strongest force of Bauhaus was that there was a common goal and many creatives wouldn't work just an island solutions for themselves, but they would work together to create something that was bigger than their own practice. And I wanted to ask Sumaya, that I really enjoy to talk now is our third talk that you're participating in and every time I was uh, totally um, yeah, amazed by the way how you think in interconnectivity. You're also representing a counter space that is an art collective and I would like you to refer to the, to the cooperation that was uh, this element in Bauhaus and how you refer to it and relate to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Nikolai, for the question. I also really always enjoy our conversations and they always leave me deep in thought as well. Um, I think absolutely this idea that you're referring to of um, cross and interdisciplinary, but also really important, I think, is the blurring of categories. Um, and when I founded Counter Space, it was really important for me that we found ways to work across discipline because I think that um, the architecture that we have and that we've inherited has so many blind spots. There is only so much that you can convey on plan. Um, and Virgil also referred to uh, the intangible aspects of architecture, which I'm also very interested in. Um, and I think, you know, working across discipline, for example, working in film and working with other artists and designers is a way of drawing realities that are embodied, working with sound, um, things that are oral and oral and that, you know, we draw heavily on from our African context and, and condition or our southern, our southern condition. I think these things have something else to offer architecture. Um, and it's very important, I think now more than ever, that architecture starts to um, take on difference and diversity. And I don't mean that in terms of sharing common ground. I mean being able to imagine from places of difference. Um, and I think for me also this aspect of Bauhaus was very powerful. I completely um, resonated very deeply with what Hans Ulrich mentioned around the amnesia um, related to Bauhaus and also, um, how do I say, some of the um, difficult aspects of Bauhaus that some of its students, for example, were involved in the design of concentration camps and so on. So I think that, of course, there is much that is difficult, but for me, there is also this reassertion of 
how political architecture and design is and always is, um, whether it's for good or for for bad, um, if we think of the involvement with, with Nazism and so on. But I remember visiting um, the Sao last year and I was very taken with a photograph that I saw there of a Bauhaus building that um, had German gable windows built onto it by the, by the German government at the time. Um, and I was, you know, because they saw the Bauhaus movement as something that was modern and progressive and against German national identity in many ways. And so their way of undoing that was to physically build over something um, that silenced this creativity. And in my context um, in South Africa, uh, with all our inherited apartheid structures and urban fabrics, um, we have so many so many challenges and our built environment is entirely inherited and warped. It's, it's, that photo for me was really powerful because it spoke about how political architecture is and has to be. And, um, you know, that reassertion that we also have to be able to imagine beyond our context and conditions. Thank you so much, Sumaya. And kind of really bouncing off one of the points that you made about, um, you know, the political uh, side of how can we actually use architecture and art to voice our concerns and you know this can very quickly become a political debate which we'll avoid turning this into but um, one of the things that's so key is really performance art during the Bauhaus it was really considered as one of the um, ways in which you could really put forward and confront and reject things that were happening in society at the time and Peter Burt's seminal book from 68 The Empty Space which really talks about the Bauhaus stage says instinctively governments know that the living event could create a dangerous electricity the theater is an arena where living and confrontation take place. Um, Nicholas, I know that you, in your practice, of course, you take this idea of approaching themes of um, you know, socio-political, racial, and historical narratives. How are you actually using that performance to voice your concerns? Well, I think that um, when it comes to performance, the great asset that it has is that it kind of, kind of, <laughs> can kind of like um, make walls porous and like you're, you're, I mean, you're really often invited, invited to do something like an institution, um, a very wide cube kind of place. But I think what you can do is that you, you can deliver or like um, use your, your physicality to really deliver a, an idea of, you know, transformatory idea in a more immediate way, in a more urgent way. And um, when I like this, um, I mean, they were describing it as like some sort of electricity, which I think is very fitting, because um, you you literally can transcend certain walls with that. And I think you're spreading you're spreading words, even if you I mean, if even even if you take in, into account that you can use like sound and stuff like that, words are reaching people's minds in whatever kind of way. And I think that's what performance can do in a really nice way, because you're activating people's minds. Um, and also, it's not really expected. The format is pretty. Um, it's pretty open. If you want it to be like that, you can play around with the stage, with the idea of the stage. And I think what architecture does really often is that it kind of gives a certain. It sets the parameters for whatever happens in that space. And um, as you have like legs, you can move around and stuff like that. I think it totally gives you um, the ability to transcend those hurdles. And um, as we see today, for example, this is in a way really performative for me. Like we're trying to, you know, circulate certain ideas, discuss something, and we have like the information traveling through like various channels. And I think um, that's really the asset. When I think about the um, the title for this discussion, I'm really thinking like it's n it's not so much that you want to break something, or, like destroy something. It's rather that you um, kind of like try to make things porous and like try and see filter what was maybe interesting, what was problematic, but that to like kind of filter and get that certain essence of what Bauhaus might mean or still means for today's um, yeah, cultural sector, really. Um, thank you so much. And I, I really, uh, touching on all of those points, really, um, and this is something that um, Hans Ulrich in so many of your lectures has really inspired 
um, you know, so many people, your focus also on Cedric Price's um, Fun Palace, which was developed in the early 60s, which was, again, this idea of an interchangeable space. What does the future city look like? What does the future of culture? And really this idea of a university of the streets. And today, more than ever, I think we are becoming a university of the streets. So how do you think that is something that we're looking at into the future? Yeah, I think just following on, you know, what Nicolas said about the idea that it's, you know, not so much about only breaking it. I think it's, of course, I mean, Daniel Birnbaum often quotes Panofsky when he says, you know, and, and this is a, it's a sort of a interpreted quote. It's not a direct Panofsky quote. But Panofsky somehow said something like, you know, we use fragments from the past to invent the future. And that's how I kind of read your title. Um, which, uh, and so, of course, it is important you know, to critically assess the Bauhaus, you know, as very much Sumaya said. But, and it's important at the same time to think, you know, how can we use fragments from the past to kind of build the future? And it's interesting if you look at the neo avant-garde of the 60s, and you know, the Fun Palace you mentioned is actually Cedric Price together with John Littlewood. And John Littlewood was this amazing street theatre pioneer. She pioneered street theatre in the UK. So it was a collaboration, an interdisciplinary collaboration. And I think we, you know, that has been in several of the remarks so far, I think something which uh, has been mentioned that the interdisciplinary aspect of the, of the Bauhaus is super relevant for now. I think that we need to, it's a moment where we can only address the big questions. Uh, and of course, ecology is one and the major topic, but many other topics, we can only address them if we go beyond the fear of pooling knowledge, if we basically break down silos. And I mean, I remember when I grew up in, in Zurich, you know, as a, as a teenager, I went to see, I think, about 40 times this exhibition of Harald Seemann, Hang zum Gesamtkunstwerk. And then, you know, that's how I found out about Schlemmer, that's how I found out about Schwitters, that's how I found about, uh, out also, you know, about boys. And in a way, um, it was very much this connection, of course, and that, to, to wrap it up, you know, that is what the Fun Palace was. It was basically inspired by Moholy Nagy, inspired by Lisitsky, inspired by, you know, Donner and what Donner wanted to do in Hanover. This idea how one could actually do an interdisciplinary and also dynamic, you know, institution. It came from this idea when Picabia said museums are cemeteries and then they wondered, you know, how could one do the opposite? How could one do um, a, an interdisciplinary arts organization where all the disciplines could meet and they conceived of this, this fan palace uh, as, a, as a really transformative kind of structure and it remained an unrealized project. It's actually interesting that we did work on a sort of a reinterpretation of that Fun Palace idea with Kuhnle. So maybe we should actually listen to Kuhnle. Uh, he might be in a better position to answer your question, you know, about the Fun Palace, because Kuhnle built a structure in dialogue with Tino Segal uh, in, in New York for the prelude of the shed, uh, which was almost like a mini Fun Palace. So it would be, I think Kuhnle should, should answer your question. Kuhnle seems to be frozen at the moment. Because it was very beautiful, you see, because Kuhnle designed in New York City a tiny little, and it's the first time that that was actually, you know, a fun palace sort of of that sort was built, because you would have um, a rap uh, concert which would segue into a dance performance, which would, uh, you know, so you'd have uh, uh, then a panel, and then all of a sudden the walls of Kuhnle would dissolve again. And then, you know, so it would basically be, you imagine there's an art historical conference about the Fun Palace, which Roya asked about. Then the walls of Kuhnle would go out. And five minutes later, you would have Abra, you know, who would do a concert. And then that would go on. And then all of a sudden some walls would come back and there would be some form of structured space. And then Bill Forsyth, you know, would do a dance performance. And then, after that, it would sort of fluidly go into um, uh, a Tino Segal piece, uh, and then all of a sudden, the walls would move again, and it would again be you know, a rap concert. So you know, that, that sort of fluidity that you'd go from Abra or Princess Nokia to uh, a, a, an academic Party conference. Me. And Kunle is back, hurrah. It's Kunle back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, hi, thank you. Yeah, I, I, want, I could hear you, uh, Hans, Hans Werner. Thank you, that was, that was actually a very apt uh, description of the project. Um, and it was really a lot of fun working with you and uh, working with Tino Segal and, and the rest of the team uh, at the Shed on this project. And indeed, fundamentally, the idea of the space was to explore, from our perspective, 
um, how, how can architecture uh, be more human? How can we create a space that, uh, that, um, that can move, that can dance, that can adapt to its environment and can uh, basically transform to respond to the changing uh, programmatic uh, requirements that we always have from arts to music to fashion uh, so, you know, pretty much the, the uh, tenets of what the Front Palace uh, uh, sought, out, sought to do. And um, I think you've given a very uh, beautiful exclamation of how the space worked. Um, essentially, it was a, a, a roof space with walls that were made of chairs, and the chairs were on wheels, and we could basically transform the space from a complete black box to uh, an open space by literally moving the walls um, manually. So that was, that was quite a, a fun project, and, um, and uh, I, I, I think we're looking forward to doing even a, a more, um, a newer iteration of that uh, soon. This is how a city should look like, right? This is how a city should yeah. look like, not only an art project, but this should be our life, not only in art, but in reality, right? Yeah, that's actually exactly yeah. what um, I wanted to then kind of bounce off of that with um, what Sumaya is doing, where I, I read this beautiful um, description where um, they create spatial fairy tales. And I love this idea because everything we spoke about really resonates towards that. Um, and she writes so beautifully, so I have to say one quote um, about this thinking of um, architecture and a city life is, as spatial practitioners, we must become more fluent in comprehending our context. We do not situate our practice with having a luxury choosing not to see the realities of our city. The city is there if you know how to read it. Um, so Sumaya, if you can hear from far away, um, has the purpose of our city actually changed or have we simply been reading it wrong? Um, I think we've been reading it in one way for too long. Um, and I think that often when people speak of Johannesburg, um, for example, or many African cities for that matter, words like elusive or chaotic um, are used. But I think that those words sometimes come from a lack of understanding a different point of view or a different perspective. Um, and, you know, even in how we think about, for example, the environment, or if we think about something like a humanist approach, um, these words, in their etymology in English, um, construct reality in a certain way. Um, so, for example, environment situates ourselves and then something outside of us. But in many, in many African and other realities, the environment is seen very much as a part of who we are. Um, and words like private and public don't exist in many languages where I'm from. Um, but rather words that we use um, roughly translate to something like intimate or like um, communal or gathering, which I think are also much more fluid terms and, and can allow for a much more fluid understanding of how we can um, embrace and approach space in our cities. Um, so I think, I think that perhaps it's about involving and including the reality of many different perspectives and voices. Um, and I think also if we think about Bauhaus and if we think of the interdisciplinarity there, um, I think that there is so much to be learned in drawing on, um, in drawing on different disciplines, but also in drawing on different uh, voices, in bringing together as many voices as we can for, for everything that we do, and in engaging in dialoguing and in listening deeply to place so that we shift the edges of ourselves to include our environments and to include others as well, and also to include um, things that we consider inanimate, like, I don't know, rocks and water and so on. These are also all really much integral to ourselves and our beings. Um, thank you so much, and I think that this exactly what you're talking about, this dialogue about 
um, you know, with different people and humans and nature and, you know, a dialogue that we're having with our city today, you know, versus the dialogue we were having six months ago is dramatically different. There was actually a New York Times article that came out this morning, which was, you know, a hundred different businesses that wrote a petition against uh, and letter to Bill de Blasio about the widespread anxiety that has fallen over New York and the future of its city. Um, and that's all about safety. It's about cleanliness. Um, it's about the quality of life. And many people are taking these issues of, you know, city abandonment and overrun by disorder um, into their own personal lives. So, you know, the question really is how is this exodus from cities. Now, many people are working from home for the foreseeable future. Um, Mark, maybe this is an interesting question for you. For so many people who are actually now working from home and we're kind of restructuring the experience we have with art and community and, uh, you know, the cities around us, do you think the future of our cities are at risk in that sense? Wow, that's a huge question. Um, I like to ask huge questions. And I'm 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 a, a devout what the French call a citadin. Like I'm I'm a city a city person. Um, although I like the countryside as well. But I think in a weird way, like cities, the cities that are most interesting to me, the cities that excite me the most, are places like Istanbul, Beirut, Mexico City, Naples. You know, imperfect cities, just like we're imperfect people. You know, and I think, um, in a weird way. Uh, obviously, what's happening to New York right now is terrible. There's no question about that, you know. Um, but actually, what was happening to New York before was terrible, which is that basically, you know, if you couldn't, if you weren't like an ultra high net worth individual, you you couldn't work or live within, you know, within the city. Um, you know, and the reality is that a lot of people who've left New York now are the people who can afford to. Um, uh, but in the end, you know, I think. Uh, if you look at this in a sort of Panglossian, optimistic way, you could say that we're in this stage where the city could recover this more kind of Jane Jacobs ver version of a kind of the balanced, you know, mixed use, mixed incomes, mixed races living together in a way which was productive and exciting. Um, I think I'm, I'm not one of these people who believes that everything is going to change. I think if there's one thing that's going to change as a result of this pandemic, it's the way in which we work. Um, I don't see many people going back to working, you know, the classic like Swiss 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., five days a week in the office, et cetera. And I think, um, uh, yeah, a lot of people will work from other places, you know, where they can have better, more balanced lives. Um, but it doesn't mean that the cities have to get hollowed out in the process. I think that may give more room for more interesting things that aren't as, um, as, as sort of capital intensive. You know, I think, I think one of the great things about Berlin is that it's the kind of place where you could do a super niche little thing because your rent was next to nothing. Also, little galleries can, can survive here. So, um, you know, I think we have to make it through, and I don't think all cities will make it through, and I don't think all businesses will make it through, and a lot of it will depend upon how good the governments are at doing their job. You know, I, I haven't read this letter um, to de Blasio, you know, and I'm not really sure what they're asking him to do. Um, but I mean, um, you know, the, the fear, the, 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 the risk is real, but it's not, you know, to come back to, to Virgil's point before, you know, we're in this moment of change, and I think those of us who have the power to steer things a little bit should be thinking about this classic phrase that you can either be an agent of change or a victim of circumstance. And even as much as events are rolling over us, the question is to what extent can we, in this moment of disruption, disruption push the cities towards something that's a better version of what we had before, um, and not a total collapse. And my fear, my, my, my belief is that some cities will more or less collapse and other cities will intelligently through the actions more of the citizens and of the politicians redirect themselves into a, a better version of what they were before. I don't know if I answered your question, but I tried. Solidly, <laughs> solidly. Um, yeah, and exactly on that point of Virgil, you know, I think this idea of working really bleeds into collaboration because it's this human contact, it's, um, you know, engagement and collaboration, of course. Virgil, for you, who really has your hands dipped in so many different pots, um, you always um, and often stress about kind of the importance of collaborative working and, you know, uh, then doing collaborations with Nike and Murakami and Ikea and then also now a Japanese designer. Um,
can you share, you know, why collaboration is so important and also how it can manifest itself in urban planning? Well, I think it's, you know, even in this year in 2020, we can understand, you know, the disconnect that happens between humans when we don't communicate. You know, I often swap the word collaboration just for conversation. You know, like, every time I talk to Hans, like, 30 ideas brew out of that. <laughs> you know, every time I talk to a best friend, you know, an idea emerges. And, you know, understanding that, that we as humans have so much to solve for, you know, equates to we need to be in conversation. We need to find the middle ground between both of our sentiments. You know, this talk is very much that. Like, by all of us speaking in sort of a cyclical form, we're sort of organizing things that are intangible. And when we talk about modern ways of working or modern ways of communicating, you know, something that really spoke out to me is when Hans is, you know, before we start talking about the Bauhaus, we're we're revisiting the, the parts that were left to amnesia, you know, or we're, we're sort of having a, a, a looking back view. And I think when it comes to looking forward, there's a lot that can be solved for within sort of blurring disciplines, but also, you know, blurring practices. Um, and I think that's for the better of the whole ecosystem when, uh, you know, collaboration or being in conversation is adopted into like wider practice. Totally. And I think that also really bouncing off of that, you know, now, especially with today's topics and lectures, this idea of what does our collaboration with nature now look like, that so many of us are reconnecting with nature and what does architecture look like in nature? Um, you know, uh, there's a movement that Moholy Naj was a part of in London after the Bauhaus broke down, and that was all about ecologists and Bauhaus experts coming together in a new commune and seeing the importance of this coexistence. There must be no antagonism between architecture and a natural setting. Um, and Kunle, this is a question I'd love to ask you. Um, your Black Wino Academy master plan in Tanzania was a campus that you've built for students that is still under construction, completely in wildlife, and you're completely immersed in an environment to learn, um, you know, topics and also about nature. Um, how are you balancing this idea of nature and innovation um, into the architecture? The Black Wino Academy is uh, a project that was. Um uh, that we began a couple of years ago and um, it, it's the site is in Karatsu which is a village um, on the way to the Ngorogoro crater uh, it, it's a small village there's just one main one road that goes right through it and the client uh, had lived uh, wanted to build a school for students and uh, quite ambitious projects within a you know completely remote area and it was very clear from my first visit that one of the important things about education is that we actually need to not only learn these, the formal education, but it's, it's a great opportunity for the students to also learn from the environment. So one of our first things, uh, our first uh, uh, goals was to create a campus that was uh, very immersive in the environment. and. Uh, the, the spaces would allow the students to be inspired by the landscape, by the animals. You know, you have you know really wildlife running around, um, and also build um, the, the structures from the materials that were locally available. Um, it's it's in, we've been building this in stages, and the uh, sports field has just been completed, and uh, apparently the nationals the national. Football Association of, of uh, Tanzania is looking to go play their football there because they actually appreciate being in the completely immersed in nature. Um, I mean, we've learned a lot, and I think that's the approach that we have uh, for most projects where what we do is to start by learning from the environment and learning from people and understanding what the local capacities are and innovating uh, by just giving a little bit more value to uh, 
uh, and a little bit more um, uh, adding some knowledge that would help to push it a, a step further. But really understanding the capacity that they have, understanding the, the, the crafts, the skills, uh, understanding the, the, the resources that are available, and looking at the history of the environment, of the place and the people. So we've, um, uh, we've, we're, we're working on the, the completion phase of the project now, and uh, quite excited to see that students are really, um, truly inspired by being there. Um, that sounds so incredible, and this idea of also education and nature and how the two are so closely linked and really leading into this topic of eco-architecture. Um, Hans Ulrich, I know this is a topic, of course, that you're an extreme expert in, um, so I won't try to quote you on it. Um, but there was a, uh, you know, one of the theses of these Lawn Road flats from London that resonated with me that brought Bauhaus designer and ecologists together through shared belief that the human household should be modeled on the household of nature. Um, and, of course, your Back to Earth project really explores architecture in those spaces, outside of hierarchy, all about well-being and also involving the environment. Um, and I know that your project with Sumaya um, is also under that, so I would love to hear from you and then also from Sumaya about um, that collaboration and how that process is. Yeah, it's actually really interesting that you mentioned before, you know, Moholy Naja also and London, because it's actually something which is really interesting in relation to Sumaya and in relation to the Serpentine Pavilion, which for the first time is a pavilion over two years, because it's basically a project which, uh, and I'm sure Sumaya will tell us more about that uh, after, which is going to happen in many different communities. So the idea is that the pavilion is not only happening in Kensington Gardens, where it always happens in front of the gallery, but uh, Sumaya will collaborate with many, many different communities bring these communities you know, to Kensington Gardens, but also bring the pavilion and the whole research. Um, it, it will be really a collaboration in that sense, as, you know, as Virgil said, and a conversation to, to quote Virgil. And I think what is interesting, if you think about Moholy Natch, and I, I had this experience with Moholy Natch because last year I was asked to be in this documentary uh, about Moholy Natch and actually read, read his text. And, it was kind of fiasco in one way because I couldn't really do the Hungarian accent, but <laughs> I kind of tried. But you know, it made me read all his texts really carefully, which is why it resonates so much with what you just said about these London years where he connected in a way, he called actually nature a construction model and uh, connected in a way really this idea um, of um, uh, the Bauhaus and, uh, and nature. And um, I think in a way, but that leads us also to, um, to Back to Earth, because of course Sumaya's uh, pavilion is very much part of our Back to Earth project, because we decided for the 50th anniversary you know, to not only look back with the archive, but to look to the next 50 years, and to basically invite 50 artists to do an environmental campaign. And of course one of the things when we start to think about what uh, sustainable you know, curation and sustainable programming means in an institution, um, it of course also means that we go beyond the, the event uh, horizon, no? Because obviously, uh, if it's um, uh, exhibitions or uh, biennales or art fairs, I mean, all the, the, the basically the formats, no, we have in the art world are related to events, and uh, they you know, either last a week or they last a weekend or they last a month. And I think this idea of thinking about long durational formats is really interesting. How we can somehow think about um, uh, sustainable long duration formats. And for that reason, we invited artists, you know, not to do an exhibition only, but to actually do these campaigns, which are going to evolve over, you know, over 50 years, over the next 50 years. And also with Counterspace, with Sumaya, the idea that the pavilion, you know, is not, because usually the pavilion is always uh, very quickly built, you know, and then we do a program. But now it's a very different process. There's much, much more dialogue. And the last thing I wanted to say is actually interesting because we had a panel with uh, Nicolai and Terme uh, in Miami during our Basel Miami. I think it was uh, a year and a half ago. And uh, it was a, a kind of an idea there to think about the future of the city uh, as a sustainable city. And it connects very much also with uh, what, what Mark was saying, you know, the kind of imperfect city. Uh, and we made this exercise that at the end of the, of the panel, we basically ask all 
the speakers, and uh, the speakers included uh, Arthur Jaffer, Tokwasi Dyson, Virgil Grace Wells Bonner, and also Francis Kiray, who is going to appear here later this afternoon, about kind of how they imagine you know, the future city to be. So not only about how, because I think that's the other question. Uh, I mean, Mark spoke in a wonderful way about what can happen to existing cities and how they will be changed. Some will do better than others, others will reinvent themselves. But I think there is also this question about new cities, you know, yeah. what are the cities we want? And of course, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a city like Brasilia, you know, which was really a top-down master plan, you know, um, by Costa and by, by Oscar Niemeyer. But it's going to be maybe more what Lotus Tambese, you know, the amazing Bauhaus um, uh, architect, uh, imagine, know that it's going to be a much more horizontal collaborative effort of many, many people, which I thought is interesting in the panel to ask many people, you know, and, and not only the panelists, we also ask in, in this panel everybody in the room, what is their city? And, you know, some of the thoughts, I mean, we actually talked about the conversation collaboration he told us today. Grace talked about the importance, actually, of a city to meditate and exercise, not that we have communal spaces. As a Jaffer talked about the idea that it's about freedom, you know, that it's a city where we, we, we all can be free. Uh, and Tokwase talked about the idea really also of water infrastructure, you know, and uh, uh, so, so and then of course Francis Kelly talked about a city without boundaries, a city in a way with no struggle. What we didn't know is that whilst we actually had the panel, Virgil uh, on the phone recorded it all, and the moment the panel was over, Virgil sent the sound file to the students uh, he, of his, because he's teaching at the AA in London, at that time a seminar, and asked the student to build a model, you know, of what was discussed in this panel. But anyway, that's some of the thoughts which came to my mind about your question. Um, totally, and I think Sumaya, then it would be fantastic really bouncing off of so many of the points that you made of your Serpentine Pavilion project, which as you said, is really taking this idea of um, you know, sustainability and taking recycled construction waste um, and also bringing in and bringing to light different migrant communities, bringing from five different boroughs of London. So it would be great to hear a little bit about how that project came about. Um, absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you, hans Uwe, for the amazing um, introduction to the work on the pavilion. It's been such a phenomenal um, honor to collaborate with the Serpentine as well. And I think I'm also so deeply honored at how much they uh, have been willing to listen and collaborate with sometimes very strange ideas and thoughts as well. Um, so I'm deeply honored. Um, but I think, yeah, uh, but for, for us, it was really important that this pavilion um, is making a claim about what the future of the city can be and can look like. And it was really important for me to approach sustainability, of course, in terms of the environment is a very important aspect. And as you mentioned, um, the pavilion is constructed entirely out of recycled construction waste and recycled materials. But it was also really important to understand um, the deeper and longer project of sustainability and to understand that it touches so many aspects of our lives. Um, uh, and, you know, also that, how do you phrase it? The, the, there are inextricable links between the, the challenges that we're facing in our environment and climatically. And of course, um, forces of migration, um, of class and labor struggles, every, all, all of these issues are deeply connected and can be traced back to colonization and, and forces of empire and extraction. And so it was really, really important that the pavilion did reach as many voices um, as we're able to. It does reach as many voices as we're able to. On the one hand, that is physically through how it's designed and, and where the pieces draw inspiration from, many of them from um, places of forgotten migrant histories in London, but also um, everyday spaces of ritual that touch people's everyday lives and are really important to how people construct belonging in their city, in their own city. Um, and some of these rituals uh, include um, lots of forms of gathering, but many are around food, music, um, uh, and other forms of cultural production, like publishing and so on. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that in terms of sustainability, it is really important to think through every time we build something, 
not just who is building it and what are we building it with, but how many people does this impact and how many people does it affect? And beyond the physical construction of something, beyond, as Hans Ulrich said, um, just events and so on, how can we start to seed deeper collaborations? How can we start, start to see deeper listening to each other? Um, and also, you know, deeper forms of knowledge. How can we start to see new kinds of practices in all of the work that we do? And I hope that this pavilion will be um, a foray into that. Uh, thank you. We're so excited to see it. Um, and I think that, you know, eco-architecture, and I think, again, like you said, community um, and uh, sustainability all lead, I think, really beautifully. Maybe if Kunle, you could tell us more about your Makuko Floating School, which is one of the most um, really groundbreaking projects um, of a floating structure that you've created and all of your research on, um, you know, the fact that 80% of the world's major cities um, are actually situated by water. Um, so this is a really kind of mass uh, urban concept that you've developed um, that's already reached five different countries. So we'd love to hear about it. At the heart of it, it was a project that began when I was looking for a way to contribute to the development of Lagos State, which is, of course, one of the, it's the most popular city in, in Africa, as, as it stands, it's set uh, with, with nearly 20 million people, and uh, trying to find solutions for affordable housing. And I, I at the time, um, asked myself, you know, if we're trying to solve uh, the challenge of affordable housing, we, we need to look around look at what everyday people are uh, doing to provide um, yeah, homes for themselves. What is the cheapest dwelling in a city like Lagos? And it occurred to me that uh, it's, uh, the community of Makoko, which is uh, what you technically define as a slum on water, where building people of the community who are building some of the cheapest dwellings. And that if we could be... Um, if we could learn from how they were able to build so much out of so little and we could uh, collaborate and work with them to improve on that technology, um, maybe we might have a, a solution to um, uh, addressing some of the housing issues in, in the city. And uh, that coincided with a very important uh, moment where there was a huge flood in Lagos in 2011 uh, and it really felt like an epiphany at the time where I realized that we're not only dealing with the challenges of urbanization, uh, but we're also dealing with the uh, ch challenge of climate change, where although Africa is said to be the least responsible for climate change, it is actually one of the most affected by it. Uh, so we have a condition where cities in Africa uh, are growing rapidly, uh, and they are also, uh, most of those cities are on the coast. And indeed, 80% of the cities uh, or, or more are by water all over the world. That's just a, it's a fact, because cities are settled around water. Um, and uh, our view now is, obviously, that with the challenge of climate change, we're going to be seeing cities um, being more affected by the, uh, on one end, um, abundance of water through heavy rainfalls, sea level rise, Etc. Etc. And maybe on the extreme end, actually scarcity of water. So on the abundance side, uh, we began to look into solutions for adaptation uh, uh, to these environments and learning from the people that have done it for hundreds of years. Uh, and that was the birth of um, Makoko Floating School, which uh, is really just a prefabricated um, uh, uh, stru structure timber frame structure, it's a triangular frame structure, which allows stability and balance on water. And uh, we built that out with the community in 2012 to 2013. And uh, really, you know, created the structure with eight people. It's a three floor building and, you know, really built out of very little materials, local materials found in the area. And what we did was to innovate and constantly improve this um, system into this building uh, structure into a, a technology now that is literally a um, self-built flat pack type structure where you can 
use it for different locations uh, all over the world. So we built it in Venice. We improved the version for the Biennale. We built in um, was built in Belgium uh, and uh, China, where we then scaled it into three into a cluster. And uh, we're now currently building our, our, our fifth version uh, we're in Cape Verde, where I'm at now, um, in an island, remote island called uh, Sao Vicente. Um, uh, and we're building a floating music hub uh, using the system. So the, the goal is really to use, to, this is one of many solutions that we think are uh, important in the future um, present challenge of adaptation uh, to climate change and growth of cities, uh, especially those on the coast. And it is one that is a nature-based solution that we think is important to build from very basic means, something that people have access to. It's inclusive, uh, allows um, with very little technology, very low technology, uh, but potential high uh, um, tech integration uh, as a solution for essentially uh, bringing us closer to the environment. Uh, so our position is that instead of fighting water, uh, we should really just learn to live with it. And uh, this is one of many, um, uh, you know, nature-based uh, solutions that we imagine can be used for housing, hospitality, retail, uh, commercial schools, um, healthcare facilities all around the world. I just want to add to what Kunli was saying. I think it's really interesting to observe how, like nowadays, the um, you know, the um, observation is like we're looking more at ways of like getting back in touch with the nature, and I think um, a lot of that is probably stemming from the fact that people are really tired of what they have, and I think um, that when you think about like building. It really often, you know, is cementing the status of its owner, like um, in a way, also a way of, um, you know, really often it's about like keeping your possession. And when I think of my grandparents who are like living in a really rural area on an island in the Philippines, I was asking them once why they are like building, why they, where they are living like in a wooden, you know, wooden shed in a way, like a really simple house made out of bamboo and stuff like that, like palm leaves, and they were like. Why would we want to build like a house with like solid walls if there's like nothing inside? And I was thinking to myself, that's actually really clever. If you like, you know, they have like a lot of natural disasters and stuff like that there. But if um, that little house is destroyed, there's like nothing inside. There's no sense in like building solid walls if there's nothing to protect. And I think that's a very interesting observation when you look about or when you think about the West, where everyone has like so much possession, so much like real estate, and you literally want to protect something. And I think we are observing right now like a shift in that thinking, even when you think about like young people who don't want to have, who don't want to own their own house. They're traveling all over the place and like, they're like renting maybe rather than like building their own apartment. And I think, um, yet again, like we're maybe there, that's a connection point to Bauhaus where, you know, the modular system in a way or that kind of thinking might factor in again. Yeah. Uh, totally. So, so uh, there's another connection that is exactly going the same direction, that nature actually is the Gesamtkunstwerk. Yeah. Because what the virus told us or, or teached us is that we have these invisible connections. Yeah? So it doesn't matter that I'm rich. If my neighbor is poor and is not able to sustain a healthy lifestyle, I will also be affected. We are all connected invisible in an invisible way. And these invisible connections are also the connections that are actually creating the design of the city. So nothing is an island. Everything is, you know, the supply chains are actually deciding uh, how I create a city, how I create a shop, how I create the transport ways, etc., etc. So it's all interconnected. And we may be, so what Bauhaus understood is that we need to act together, extremely interdisciplinary, also taking under consideration what we can see. What we can't know yet, for example, like the molecular level of our design and of our life that we can see, so we are excluding it from our design, but actually it's affecting all of us. So Walter Gropius said, uh, action is needed. Now more than ever, issues of private and public health have come to the fore in a very direct way, causing us to rethink our ways of life and how we can learn from previous triumphs and failures. I think this is exactly the motto of this talk here, and 
of the question how we want to go forward. And with this uh, quote, I would like to open it up maybe for one, two questions from the podium or from, from the audience. Uh, and I would like also um, to put a question in the room that Hans Ulrich already uh, addressed. It's a question to everybody here in this room. How, uh, with one sentence, uh, and everybody obviously on the screens here in your rooms, how in one sentence you would envision now, after or during COVID, uh, the motto, uh, the one sentence for a manifesto that you would put into the manifesto of a city of the future. Maybe Hans, if you may start. Yeah, I think uh, we should begin really with the artists and architects, uh, in a way, no? To listen. You I think today, we always right? to listen to artists and architects. How? They imagine the city. I mean, what I believe is that um, the city, you know, of the 21st century should be about generosity. So here is a sentence. So then, Virgo, what, what is your take? We we got your take on it before COVID in 2018, and now we went through so many things that proved us right back then. Our discussions. Our what would you say with uh, with your today's perspective? Yeah. You know, I would say that the, the future city should be built on conversation. Beautiful. So, Maya? Um, I think on a deep listening to place. Thank you. Kunle? Um, I, I would say it should be built on love. <laughs> That's so true. Well, I would say that um, the future city should be built on mutual interest. Um, I think the future city needs to be built in the current cities because the thing we don't need is any new cities. I mean, we have enough cities. When you, when you start talking about this, I'm going to say more than a sentence because it really, I had this kind of fear. When you start talking about the new cities, I imagine these American suburbs where you have a deserted strip mall, and then another deserted strip mall, and another, like, we have the raw material in the cities. We have the human raw material. We have the, the architectural raw material. We have the commercial raw material to build great cities where there already are cities. The last thing we need is new cities that hollow out the old cities, you know. That is not the collaborative, loving, generous gesture that my colleagues have spoken about. What we need to do is as a transdisciplinary exercise, think about how to take the cities that exist and turn them into organisms to live better, more balanced lives at every level. Uh, I'm going to plagiarize my quote and motto, um, which is my favorite quote from Schlemmer, which is, perhaps the ultimate wisdom is compromise. So uh, I want to encourage everybody of you to um, to propose us uh, ideas. We are a company that is not uh, creating talk programs only. We are creating real buildings, real investments, and uh, they are in major cities. And we really want to test the future. We really want with you together to create a platform that we can not only talk through, uh, think through, and. Um, and generously share, but we also want to really build it. And I think this is uh, something that is maybe first time in history we have also the technology to create the city that uh, we really want to live in and uh, nothing less should be what we should aim for. And I want to thank everybody and especially Roya Sachs for moderating this panel and everybody here on the panel to participating in it. And thank you very much and thank you also to our audience.